hello and welcome this is paul sendu on sunday february the 12th 2017. today i wanted to do a little program on the subject of gps and uh, satellites communications gps of course has become uh, ubiquitous in our society now you know every phone every car basically has it and uh, people have just come to depend upon it so much so that we don't even use you know paper maps anymore anyhow as i was doing some research on this subject i believe i have now come to believe and i will share my findings with you that gps does not work through satellite communications because i do not believe satellite communications actually exist so the method of communication which is called tropospheric scattering which has been in use going back you know somewhere around the 1940s but uh, almost it was, was perfected in the 50s and 60s uh, it is the technology that i believe is being used to to do these uh, global what's called global positioning which in reality then becomes a ground based positioning system using communication technologies which have been with us for like 60, 70, 80 years now. One thing people think is that, you know, all the technologies we use today, such as cell phones or like this GPS, for example, that they are new, but that is not the case. These technologies actually were originally created or invented back in the, I would say the 30s and 40s. And by the 60s, they had been perfected. I even like, I remember seeing a James Bond movie in which Sean Connery, you know, his uh, arch enemy, let's say, or no, or Sean Connery himself, used a GPS tracking device on one of the enemy's agents that he was following. Okay, so these technologies, they have been existing. The only thing is that they were not in public's hand because certain things need to happen. For example, with computers, you know, computers have been around, what, since the 30s and 40s. We know all those big boxes that look like a railway car which were had like you know processing power that of uh, uh, maybe a small Motorola phone back from the 1980s okay those kind of computers have existed but they have not it was not practical to put them into the hands of the public because you know can you imagine like you know, having a personal computer which is the size of your living room of course you it doesn't that that doesn't make any sense so the technology had to be developed and advanced enough that for one thing it could be miniaturized and secondly it could be made cost effective and that's what happened with computer technologies you know computers became smaller they became, the processing power became greater and the costs became lower especially as they moved into mass production same thing has happened with telecommunications cell phone technologies etc have been around since the 50s and 60s at least and i would even contend going back to the 30s and 40s but it is only over time that they became advanced enough that they could be made small enough you know like can you imagine like trying to carry a phone about the size of a microwave oven of course now it doesn't make any sense this is what the military used for example during the war etc where they had a guy with this big backpack you know and then the guy with the telephone he's cranking it out you see that in old movies and uh, that was not practical for the average person to use so once the technologies advanced and the size became not a factor anymore and the cost came down they went mainstream and now everybody's using them okay but that does not mean i'm going to play some videos for you in which they tell us that you know these communication technologies such as tropospheric scattering was built in the 50s 40s and 60s all across the world but then they were replaced by satellites the question is were they or did they just get replaced by smaller, more efficient dishes that we can open our eyes, walk down any street in any city, and you are going to see thousands of them. So that technology never went away. It just became smaller and more powerful. That's all. But what that proves is, as we study tropospheric scattering, 
that the only real way that this can work is that the signal is beamed upwards. It hits something solid and it bounces back. And that, my friends, to me so far, is one of the most indisputable evidence for a solid firmament above us, just as we can read in Genesis chapter 1, that God made a firmament above us to separate the waters that were under the firmament on the earth from the waters that are above. Okay, so let's go ahead and play some video clips. I'm going to play a couple of video clips for you. One is about this project called Project White Alice. Interesting names are chosen by the military for their projects and their operations. White Alice, like Alice in Wonderland. Okay, White Rabbit, going down the rabbit hole. So these are, again, clues that are given to you that, yes, we are going to give you this fiction of this tropospheric communication system when it is not really that, it is something else. I believe this whole explanation that is given that these signals were aimed up at the atmosphere and then they just bounce back. How? You know, the atmosphere where they were being aimed at was nothing but air and some water vapor. So how did they bounce back down to the earth? Okay, but that's the real, that's basically the explanation for this means of communication called tropospheric scattering. I would say that the signals perhaps were indeed beamed upwards, but they were not sent back down by some clouds. No, my friends, they hit something solid and then they bounced back. And this is the only way that such communication can work. It needs both a fixed transmitter and it needs a fixed firmament or something solid that the signal can hit and then it can be directed towards the receiver. That's how all communications work. You know, there is a transmitter and there is a receiver. Like mouth, for example, is the transmitter, the ear is the receiver, okay? So generally, wireless transmission occurs when two, when the transmitter and the receiver are in direct line of sight. So, you know, like you have a plane surface for like say five miles, and you can send the sig shoot the signal across the plane from one transmitter to a receiver, which is five miles away. And if there is no nothing blocking the signal, like a mountain or a hill or like a building or some other structure, then the signal will get to the receiver without any problem. Okay, but as we shall see in this method of tropospheric scattering, where they say you know they're just gonna shoot it off in the atmosphere and it comes back down. There are way too many things that can interfere in that process that would make it nearly impossible for the signal, first of all, to be redirected up into the sky, then redirected back to the ground. And secondly, the positioning of how it would be positioned so it went and hit an exact receiver would not really work if it was, that's all that was being done. So there was more that's going on in this type of communications in my belief. It is hitting something very solid up there and that way it can be positioned, the triangulation can be exact because they know that at a certain point, the signal is going to hit a solid object and from there it can be, it can be redirected, triangulated towards any receiver. And these communications, they work very well. This type of, this type of communication, for example, in the Vietnam War, you know, these communications were handled out of California and Vietnam is clear on the other side of the world, yet they worked perfectly. And that cannot happen with these signals just being beamed up into scattered into the atmosphere and then you know, hoping that they're going to bounce back down. So let's play, let me play, start by playing a video clip from you about the White Alice Project in Alaska. It's about a three minute video. I'll play the whole video and then I will analyze that video. And secondly, after that, I'm going to play one more video clip, which is from 1967, I believe, from Germany, where such a similar project was also constructed. And these type of structures, these kind of transmitters and receiving stations were constructed all across the world. Okay, so even in the 1960s, the world was linked 
communications were possible. They linked Hawaii to the Philippines, to Japan, to like all the way down to Australia, across India, China, Russia, you name it, Europe. So the grid of communication was built in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, so that by the end of the 1960s, it was complete. And when it was complete, when they had this whole grid in place, then the fiction of satellite communications was pushed that we are now able to communicate across the world because we have satellites. Let's see if satellite communications is first of all possible, and secondly, if it is would if it would be an efficient way of communicating. So here goes. So we found a bunch of huge sci-fi satellite dish things on the top of a mountain in Alaska, and they look like this. And we just figured out why they're there and what they do, and it's really weird. Hey everyone, Amy here. Our friends at Seeker went on a shoot to Alaska recently and they came back with a story that we just had to tell on D News. It's about a huge, ambitious military project called White Alice. By now, the whole thing is barely a footnote in the history of the Cold War. But 60 years ago, it was revolutionary for the military and for Alaska. In order to get why White Alice was so important, you have to understand a few things about Alaska. First, it's huge, it's empty, and it's wild. In the mid-1950s, it was home to just 215,000 people spread across an area that's twice the size of Texas. That made modern communication a pretty big hassle. Stringing telegraph or phone lines between cities meant crossing hundreds of miles of rugged, usually frozen terrain. The huge distances made radio communication flaky. Even high frequency signals fritzed out when the northern lights appeared. This was all a big problem because during the Cold War, the US military needed good comm networks in Alaska. Pearl Harbor was still fresh in everyone's mind and the government feared a far north sneak attack from the Soviets. Alaska and Russia are only 53 miles apart at the Bering Strait. It's such a narrow divide that the region became known as the Ice Curtain. The US and Canadian Air Forces set up a series of radar listening posts along the Arctic Ocean, but they needed a way to relay information across the state, and fast. And that is where White Alice came in. Beginning in 1955, the Air Force and Army built a network of communications hubs that used a very new technology to connect with one another. Phone calls and other data were transmitted via microwaves, beamed up into the air, bounced off the Earth's atmosphere, and back down to a receiving site. Each hub had two sets of dishes, one set for receiving a signal and another for broadcasting it back out to the next hub. The process, called tropospheric scattering, had, and still has, a lot of advantages over other technologies. First, bouncing signals off the atmosphere means that hubs don't need a clear line of sight to communicate, which is a useful thing in a mountainous place like Alaska. This way, White Alice sites could be 200 miles apart. The signal could also support multiple phone calls at the same time, something few other systems could manage. And, crucially for the military, it was secure. Once a signal is beamed out, it can only be received at one exact spot, making it next to impossible to intercept the signal along the way. All in all, the military built 22 tropospheric scattering sites across Alaska, eventually spending around $300 million. And it wasn't alone. Similar networks sprung up all around the world. The US even connected Hawaii to the Philippines through the Pacific Scatter System. But it might have had the biggest impact on Alaska, uniting the new state in ways no other technology could have. But before White Alice was even complete, a new technology arrived to replace it. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite. U.S. development of satellite communications ramped up, and by 1967, just eight years after the network's completion, the government began to divest from the very system it built. Interestingly, White Alice remained in use until the late 70s as a civilian phone network. And today, the military still uses tropo-scattering networks here and there because they're still really secure. But this remains the era of satellites. Okay, I'll come back and dissect this video. I'll uh, analyze this video from this gal that we just watched. But uh, before we do that, let's just do a little, uh, let, let's see if we can come to a little understanding of this uh, method of call tropospheric scatter, this uh, method of communications uh, using the tropospheric scatter methodology. This is from Wikipedia. Tropospheric scatter, also known as troposcatter, is a method of communicating with microwave radio signals over considerable distances, often up to 300 kilometers and further, depending on terrain and climate factors. 
keep that uh, term and word, uh, that terminology in mind, uh, climate factors. This method of propagation uses the tropospheric scatter phenomenon, where radio waves at UHF and SHF frequencies are randomly scattered as they pass through the upper layers of the troposphere. Radio signals are transmitted in a narrow beam aimed just above the horizon in the direction of the receiver station. As the signals pass through the troposphere, some of the energy is scattered back toward the Earth, allowing the receiver station to pick up the signal. I believe this is a very disingenuous explanation, and we will see why. Normally, signals in the microwave frequency, normally signals in the microwave frequency range travel in straight lines, and so are limited to line of sight applications. Okay, keep that in mind as well, that uh, the, 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 both the receiver and the transmitter have to be able to see each other, in which the receiver can be seen by the transmitter. So communication distances are limited by visual horizon to around 30 to 40 miles. Troposcatter allows microwave communication beyond the horizon. Because the troposphere is turbulent, again, keep that in mind, because the troposphere is turbulent and has a high proportion of moisture, the tropospheric scatter radio signal signals are refracted and consequently only a tiny portion of the radio energy is connected by the receiving antennas. Frequencies of transmission around 2 GHz are best suited for tropospheric scatter systems as at this frequency the wavelength of the signal interacts well with the moist turbulence areas of the troposphere allowing signal, improving signal to noise ratios. All right, so we'll come back and study as if this explanation is really, you know, possible that uh, this method that is being used, as you can see on the screen here in this diagram, there are, the, let's say the one on the left is the transmitting station and the one on the right is the receiving station. And uh, what is happening here is that as the signal is beamed upwards above towards the horizon. This actually is not, this This diagram again is disingenuous because what this is showing you is this dish is almost pointed straight up at the sky, but that's not what the explanation was saying. It was saying that it's pointed more towards the horizon. And if you look at the horizon line, it would be much lower than where this is pointed, okay? But let's say that this is what's happening. So this signal is being sent up here towards the troposphere, which is an area of the atmosphere, which is roughly around 7 to 20 kilometers in height, okay? When you're flying in a commercial aircraft, you are passing through the troposphere at about 30, 35,000 feet. All right, so this here, the signal goes up, and then it hits this troposphere, and it bounces back down towards the receiving station. My question would be how? Okay, you have, all you have up here is some air and some water vapor, okay? And they're trying to give you an explanation that, you know, it reacts with the water vapor, etc., and that's why it comes, it proves the noise to signal ratio or whatever, fine. But what causes it to come back down? That would be my question. What, what causes these waves to bounce back down? Because they told us before that these microwave uh, in, this, in, in this frequency range, they travel in straight lines. And I would say that all waves travel, all, all energy waves, you know, all along the whole uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum, they travel in straight lines. So if this is pointed upwards, like why do they not just keep traveling straight up out into space? What is it that causes them to bounce back down? That is an interesting question. Okay, and I do not believe this explanation that they just, uh, you know, this atmosphere where there's air and water vapor, which is everywhere in the atmosphere, especially that close to the ground, is causing it to scatter back down towards the receiving station. And again, if it's just being scattered, how do they, how are they so precise that they can receive it in an exact spot? These questions are not answered by this explanation. Look at this here. This this is a picture of this uh huge transmission dish okay it looks like this is what satellite dishes used to look like back in the day this is from the 1950s and in the 1980s i used to have a satellite dish you know which was about 12 feet in diameter i believe huge in my backyard okay but now you can see like a cell phone our cell phones have receivers and transmitters see this is a cell phone which are probably just as powerful 
as uh, as the ones that were in that big 12 foot satellite dish that I have. All right, so what this is doing is, see the signal, the tower on the right will beam the signal at this dish and this dish will then, you know, bounce it out into the atmosphere up towards the sky. But then it would hit something and then it would come back down to the receiver, which is the receiving dish out of those big round dishes. You know, they are the receiving dishes and uh, that receiving dish would get it. But again, the signal, unless, unless until it hit something solid, okay, why would it come down? When you have a straight line, uh, line of communication, let's say on a plane, you set up a, a, a transmitter and receiver 10 miles apart, okay, and there's, no, there's nothing, nothing solid in between them. The signal will pass straight through the air and will go right to the receiving station, right? But if you build a wall in between, the signal won't pass through. It'll stop there. It'll bounce back towards the transmitter. So therefore, it is necessary that this signal should hit something solid in order to be received by the receiver. Not just this idea that it is hitting when you bounce it up into the air, it goes and hits something solid like the firmament. It is the only way possible that you can know where the signal is going to be received. If it's just being scattered and you know, you're just sending it out in the, into the air, you won't know like where the heck the receiver is because the tropospheric conditions, as they told us, they keep changing. You know, it, it varies with the, all the conditions vary with the heat, the season, the, the height, it ranges from seven to 20 kilometers. Okay. So, if one day is seven kilometers and the other day is 20, how the heck would you get that signal back to the same receiving spot the next day? It would need to be recalibrated. These dishes would need to be realigned, but these are fixed. So you have one fixed transmitting dish and one fixed receiving dish, which means that the place where the signal is going to be bounced from also has to be fixed. So that's what tropospheric scattering method of communication is that the signal, which cannot be directed, as let's say example, there is a mountain in between, so it cannot be sent to the receiving station directly because the mountain would bounce the signal back towards the transmitter. It has to be shot up and back down. It has to be triangulated. And I would contend that triangulation can only be possible if what is being hit is at a fixed height and that is known and it is solid. And because of that, the triangulation between the transmitter and the receiver can be perfectly calculated. And that is the only way that such communications are possible. Okay, now let's go back to that gal's video and uh, see what we can learn from it. So we found a bunch of huge sci-fi satellite dish things on the top of a mountain in Alaska, and they look like this. And we just figured out why they're there and what they do, and it's really weird. So this gal said that they found this satellite dish thing, this weird satellite dish thing on top of a mountain in Alaska. Now, uh, although it's... Uh, the dish part is correct. The satellite dish part is not. Because when these were built, there were no satellite dishes. And this actually teaches us something which is very interesting, that uh, the term satellite dish doesn't originate from satellites transmissions, okay? These dishes were in existence a long time before satellites came into existence. See, this is what a satellite dish you can see on the screen here. This is what we term a satellite dish. But these dishes, which are actually receiving dishes, they are, they have been around much longer than satellites have. So the terminology was changed at some point in time in the 1970s, I believe, when these dishes, which are receiving dishes, and that other dish which we just saw, which would be something like a transmission dish, they came to be termed satellite dishes. 
and then this gal says something weird. Well, there's nothing really weird about it. This is just how communications, radio and telecommunications worked in those days. And as we shall see, this is exactly how they work to this very day, except these dishes, just like this dish was not a satellite dish, the dishes that you see, like this one here, you know, they are not satellite dishes. These are just transmission and receiving dishes. They worked with ground-based systems, not with the satellites up in space. It's about a huge, ambitious military project called White Alice. By now, the whole thing is barely a footnote in the history of the Cold War. But 60 years ago, it was revolutionary for the military. Although this gal tells us that 60 years ago, this type of uh, telephone uh, or telecommunications uh, network that was built in Alaska called White Alice was revolutionary, this is not quite the case. Because if you really look at this here, this is a page called History, uh, JPL's, sorry, Wireless Communications. Basically, this page is about the history of wireless communications. Okay, And if you look at it, the demonstration of electrical tele telegraphy by Joseph Henry and Samuel F.B. Morse in 1832, followed shortly after the discovery of electromagnetism by Hans Christian Orsted and André Marie Ampere early in the 1820s. In the 1840s, telegraph networks are built on the U.S. East Coast and California. So anyhow, so when we read this year, this idea of telecommunications wirelessly is nothing new. It goes back a long time before the 1950s. And these are some important days here, dates on this page here. Okay, 1864, James Clerk Maxwell proved the existence of electromagnetic waves. 1887, Heinrich Hertz sent and received wireless waves using a spark transmitter and a resonator receiver. Same thing here, okay? So the idea of wirelessly transmitting and receiving electromagnetic waves, of which radio waves are a part of, is nothing new, okay? So here we go, 1920, first commercial radio broadcast in Pittsburgh. 1915, wireless voice transmission in New York to San Francisco. And 19 in World War II, rapid deployment development of radio technology. So radio technologies are quite old. Okay, radio basically means wireless. Okay, radio and wireless are interchangeable. As you can see here, for many years, wireless and radio were used to describe the same thing. The difference being that radio was the American version of the British wireless. So essentially, radio means transmission of electromagnetic waves, usually communication information, voice generally, but nowadays video, television, you know, audio and video signals, wirelessly, that's the real meaning of radio. So this is nothing new. So there was nothing revolutionary about this. This was already had been developed. It had been uh, it had been uh, basically um, you know become quite advanced during World War II years. So this idea that they would build in Alaska and other parts of the world, as we shall see, these type of networks for telecommunications and for radio transmissions, it is nothing new. It's just that what we learn from these things here is that the technology that is being used today is over 100 years old. It is just that it has become more advanced, that it has become more powerful, the transmission and reception capabilities have become more powerful, and that it has become miniaturized where, you know, like I said, a cell phone can do the same job that the 60-foot dish did back in the 1950s. Essentially, what I'm leading up to here is that the, although the word satellite, communication satellite, satellite, satellite dish, you know, like dish TV, direct TV, etc., is very commonplace in our, in our uh, world today, these are just words that do not necessarily mean 
that the way this transmission is working is that the signal is being beamed up into space to these geostationary satellites, which are like 23,000 miles up or like some 40,000 kilometers up in the sky. And then from 40,000 kilometers, it's being beamed back down. That makes absolutely no sense when we begin to understand that these telecommunications and radio transmission systems have been developed for like 150 years almost now, and they are so sophisticated, and the network is so pervasive that it covers every part of the Earth. So literally, like, you know, they work through a relay system. And I'm going to show you a little uh, video of how cell phone communications work. It's less early. It's, it's basically a relay system. So the signal is sent from your phone, for example, it's caught by the nearest tower and from the tower it's transmitted, uh, you know, to uh, the next tower, etc. till it gets to its destination. And from there it goes into a switching station which uh, basically, you know, identifies your unique phone number as the, you know, place where this receiver is located. And then it is, you know, broadcast out through a tower and your cell phone captures it. That's how it works. So it's all relays. And these relays of series of towers were built worldwide. A network has been built worldwide using transmission towers, using dishes, using cable. <clears throat> okay. This has been built over the past 80 years or so, over even longer than that. So today, there is no part of the Earth, including the Arctic, down south, wherever you want to go, in the waters on, on land that is not covered by a network. And when you have a network that is that immensely spread out over every part of the Earth, there really is absolutely no need for satellite transmissions, which we shall see. And if they were to exist, they would be very inefficient and they probably would not work. And for Alaska. In order to get why White Alice was so important, you have to understand a few things about Alaska. First, it's huge, it's empty, and it's wild. In the mid-1950s, it was home to just 215,000 people spread across an area that's twice the size of Texas. That made modern communication a pretty big hassle. Stringing telegraph or phone lines between cities meant crossing hundreds of miles of rugged, usually frozen terrain. The huge distances made radio communication flaky. Even high frequency signals fritzed out when the northern lights appeared. Uh, so basically what we learn here in this clip is that uh, Alaska is a very large place which it would be nearly impossible to uh, connect using wires. So another means of communication had to be set up using uh, wireless telephony. And of course, in that case, you know, they needed to build these uh, towers and transmission towers and of course, receiving dishes so that the signal could not only be transmitted, it could also be received. An interesting comment that she makes here is, that even high frequency signals fritzed out when northern lights appeared. This is a very important principle to understand that communication signals are easily interfered with, okay, with, by electromagnetic disturbances, by electrical storms. You know, we have all heard about the EMP, that an electromagnetic pulse can destroy all our communication systems. So essentially, radio transmission signals are very, very prone to interference from atmospheric conditions and uh, basically from, uh, you know, even doesn't necessarily have to be natural. You can also use, uh, you know, uh, an enemy can, can uh, basically interfere with signal transmissions rather easily. So these signals that are transmitted, especially into the atmosphere, they have this problem that there can be interference, interference from solar flares, etc. All these things cause interference in the signals. And if that is the case, that we are using a satellite transmissions, just think about the problem, right? That you're going to pass through the atmosphere where we have this uh, 
a great deal of electrical activity, especially when there is some kind of, you know, storm and thunder and lightning going on. When you get beyond that, you have the, uh, beyond the lower atmosphere, we are told there's this place called the, the uh, ionosphere, which is uh, filled with these charged particles. And uh, those then will interfere with the signals. Beyond that, you get into the stratosphere, the thermosphere, which is a very high temperature area. And then beyond that, we have the Van Allen radiation belts. So if these northern lights appearing could fritz out the signals according to this gal, should not these signals which are being sent out into the space, into space, also experience a great deal of interference, okay? First of all, in being transmitted upwards, then being retransmitted downwards. The problem is twofold. It's not just getting it up there. It is also on its way down as well. So therefore, I don't understand, like, you know, how these signals are that easily transmitted up into the sky and then not just up into the sky. We're not just talking troposphere when it comes to the satellite transmissions. We're talking 40,000 kilometers up into the sky. So first of all, the question is what sort of, what sort of transmission power is required to get the signal up to the satellite? And secondly, what kind of power does the satellite have that it can transmit it back over those vast distances? And thirdly, what kind of signal is it that's being transmitted that it experiences no interference? If you, those of you who have satellite, dish, TV, etc., you know, you get nice high-definition signals. Do you really believe that it's gone up 40,000 kilometers into the air, passed through all this ionosphere, passed through all the electrical disturbances, passed through the main island radiation belts, passed through the thermosphere, etc., 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 gone up there where there's very high solar radiation, and then it has made its way back here without any problems? Do you see the problem if this northern lights can interfere with these radio signals, fritz them out, like the gal said? Should the same thing not happen on a much larger scale when this signal has to travel that much further, not just once, but twice? All right, so let's just get to the juicy part of this presentation. Beginning in 1955, the Air Force and Army built a network of communications hubs that used a very new technology to connect with one another. So the very new technology that she's going to talk about is this idea of bouncing signals off the atmosphere. When calls and other data were transmitted via microwaves, beamed up into the air, bounced off the Earth's atmosphere, and back down to a receiving site. Sorry, so the, the diagram that she showed you there, it basically, let's just... Uh, back it up a little bit here so we can look at it. You know, what he's showing you is on the left hand side here there's a receive there's a transmitting uh, dish and it is sending the signal. Now remember this here this uh, this is from those days in the 50s and today they would be called satellite dishes back then they were just transmitting and receiving dishes okay and uh, if you keep that in mind that these dishes are all transmission and receiving dishes. They really don't have anything to do with your signal going out into space and hitting some kind of fictional satellite because satellite technologies and satellite transmissions, I believe once we understand what is going on here, it will become quite clear that that's really just the fiction of Arthur C. Clarke and nothing more. So here, as you can see, to show a nice straight and it tells you that you know these microwave signals and as I, as I, as I would contend that all electromagnetic waves they travel in straight lines so it's going nice up and straight and then they're showing this curved uh, surface of the sky of the atmosphere which uh, although is a broken line it kind of indicates something which is like a, a solid barrier up there that it is hitting and once it hits it it bounces straight back down into a into the in a straight line down to the receiving station and it makes like a triangle here so you can see you know if you connect that there's the these are the this would be the x axis the y and this would be the z at the bottom so that makes a triangle so what we need here is for this thing to work is uh is three points now let's call the one on the left a the one in the middle up in the top b and the one on the bottom called c 
So this ABC has to form a triangle and they all have to be fixed. But as we read before, the troposphere is anything but fixed. There's nothing solid up there. There's not, no barrier up there like they're showing you in this diagram. It is just water vapor, like when you're flying in a plane, you know, you fly through the clouds, you're flying to the troposphere. That's what it is. So you know what? If a signal hits the airplane, you can understand it's solid object is going to bounce back. But if a signal goes to the cloud, what will happen to it? It'll, it'll, it'll uh, just pass right through. That's what should happen. You know, like, I mean, uh, why is it that the signal goes up like five miles in the air and then decides to bounce back down? What happens at four miles or three miles? Is, it, is that atmosphere like really that different from what is up at five or six miles up? Not really. All we have like between the ground and the troposphere is air and water vapor, exactly what's up there at the tropospheric level. So there is no, absolutely no reason whatsoever that the signal should bounce back down and it should be that accurate that they would know where exactly it's going to be received unless the point that it hits is a fixed point it's at a fixed height, and it is a solid object. That is the only way this technology can work. And I believe if this is the correct explanation that this was what was going on in this tropospheric scattering, you know, uh, methods of communication, unless they had built these dishes all up on mountains where they could, uh, you know, communicate with each other in a direct line of sight, which I don't think would be the case, uh, or it might have been, it might have been, but I don't know for sure. But the only other way that if they're using this bouncing out the atmosphere technology, then I would say this is not a bouncing out the atmosphere technology. It is more accurately a bouncing off the solid firmament technology. Otherwise, it cannot work. The signal could also support multiple phone calls at the same time, something few other systems could manage. And, crucially for the military, it was secure. Once a signal is beamed out, it can only be received at one exact spot, making it next to impossible to intercept the signal along the way. Now, you know, this gal said that uh, this technology is very secure because the signal can be received in only one spot. And again, it brings us back to this diagram and the only way this can be received in exactly one spot which is always the same is if all those three points the A, B and C are fixed which allows for precise triangulation so that the transmitter knows how far up this signal is going to go and uh, how the distance is going to travel and what the distance will be that at which it is going to hit the firmament from which it will be bouncing back down. Now that broken line that you're looking at which here represents the troposphere so they tell us but I would contend that it more accurately represents the firmament. If this keeps shifting and this signal instead of traveling say to point B has to travel up to a point D which is like 10 miles further up how is it possible that it will be received at the receiving station C it is not possible therefore this technology with a dynamic troposphere rather than a fixed firmament this technology is not possible so there are two explanations here that either these dishes were mounted on the highest mountains so that the next dish was in direct line of sight. Okay, it may have been on a mountain which was like 200 miles away, like you told us, it can travel up to 200 miles. But, and so like, you know, a person standing there may not have been able to see the dish, but as long as the dishes could see each other, the technology would work. However, direct line of sight is not always possible, okay, as these stations were built and they were built I'll show you the Wikipedia page where they tell you that these say these type of systems were built all the way across the whole world okay so there is going to be places where a direct line of sight may not have been possible therefore I imagine that this technology of bouncing signals would actually have been deployed but then again only works 
if it hit a solid object and bounced back down. Otherwise, there is no way of deflecting. There's nothing to deflect the signal from. The signal should keep shooting straight up because these, these microwave, these radio waves, they travel in a straight line. So it should keep going right up into space until it hits something that would cause it to come back down. And the simplest explanation here is that these are being bounced off the firmament. All in all, the military built 22 tropospheric scattering sites across Alaska, eventually spending around $300 million. And it wasn't alone. Similar networks sprung up all around the world. The U.S. even connected Hawaii to the Philippines through the Pacific Scatter System. Well, as discussed earlier, these uh, stations, you could say, these uh, you know, telecommunication radio uh, transmission systems were built right across the world, as the gal told us, okay? And this is actually tropospheric, this is on the Wikipedia page. The link is in the description, Tropospheric Scatter Communications Networks, okay? So it gives you a list here, you know, NATO in Europe, United Kingdom, Germany, Portugal, Canada, Cuba to Florida, AT and uh, T Corporation, Texas, Mid-Canada Line, Pine Tree Line, White Olive, Dew Training, Dew NARS. It goes on and on and on, India to USSR. Look at this here. A single section from Srinagar, Kashmir, India to Dangara, Tajikistan, USSR. So, and then they were in China, in the Middle East, uh, all across the world in Japan. And you go Soviet, uh, this is the Soviet Russia, Republic of China, all over the world. The specific scatter system that she was talking about here, here's a map here. It shows you all the way from the Hawaiian Island, all the way into the the Eastern uh, Pacific into Japan, Philippines, and uh, right down into Australia. So what we are looking at here is a communications network built in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s that essentially connected the world through a tower relay system. And these tower relay systems have not gone away. They have become much more prolific in our time, and they are much more powerful. And they are, this scatter system that they are looking at here is nothing compared to that which exists today on the Earth, not out in space, right here on the Earth. So essentially, like if you're in the Hawaiian Islands, you can look here, you want to send a signal down to the Philippines, it's going to relay. It's going to go right along all these stations that one from one to the next to the next to the next to the next till it got to the Philippines, down into Okinawa, down into Japan and into China and across Asia and to Russia. So basically you could send a signal right across the world and bring it right back to where it started from. So the world was networked, my friends, back in the 60s, which makes the whole idea of uh, satellites redundant. What would you need satellites for if you have connected the world all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic and every point in between? Okay, and these things, they worked very well. Let me show you again like some more evidence as to how well these systems actually work. All right, so this here is a document. It's on this website called California state military california military history.org and the title the document is titled the california state military museum let me just look at here what it is it's telling us here so it is talking about the strategic communications command usa stratcom which is united states strategic communications commandment okay so this was in davis california and but look here, okay, as the United States, let's just read this one paragraph here. As the United States involvement in Vietnam grew, grew during the 1960s, the role of the facility became increasingly important, although few people other than the men stationed there knew about the facility. See, these things that we know about, such as White Alice and other communications networks, some of them we know about. We don't even know how many more were built 
that we don't even know about, okay? And I'm going to show you another video from back in 1967 in Germany that will show you that the world was networked back then long before the so-called or alleged era of satellites. So as the United States involvement in Vietnam grew during the 1960s, the role of the facility, which is this communications facility in California, became increasingly important, although few people other than the men stationed there knew about the facility. For example, in early 1965, the U.S. had 23,000 advisors in Vietnam. By the end of the year, there were 184,300 troops in the country. Consequently, the number of messages processed by the station jumped dramatically that year. In the first quarter, the station relayed, keep that word in mind, relayed. This is how communications work unto this very day that they are relayed across the earth, not up and down in space. The station relayed approximately 560,000 messages per month. The figure jumped to 997,000 per month during the last quarter when the attack on Ply May Special Forces Camp and the Battle of La Drang Valley marked the first major battles between U.S. troops and North Vietnamese Army regulars. Fortunately, thanks to good planning, the station was able to keep up with the sudden increase in the traffic without missing a beat. So what's the point here? This article, I'm going to link it in the description. Interesting reading. Okay, because it teaches you the history of communications, of telecommunications. What is being taught us here is that all the communications for the Vietnam War were being processed through California. So unless there was a network that connected California down to Asia, how could that be possible? So these networks had already been built back in the 60s. Now can you imagine how much more integrated these networks and how much more expansive these networks will have become over the last 50 plus years okay we understand and let's look at some of these uh, these videos i will show you a little bit more because this is an important important subject that uh, these towers man look around your neighborhood do you see less towers today than you did 20 years ago or more and do more and more keep springing up if all the communications could that easily be handled by these so-called satellites, why would these towers keep springing up? These are exactly, these towers are no different than these tropospheric scatter systems, okay? They have a transmission function and they have a receiving function. On these towers, you will see sometimes dozens of dishes which are both receiving dishes and there's transmission antennas on these towers. Every high-rise building and even some that are mid-rise have transmission and receiving towers on top of them. Okay, Every mountain has it. But that is just what's on the land. As we saw in that map, here we can go back and take a look at it, the Pacific Scatter System. Even right across the oceans, the Pacific, as well as the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, they have it networked, okay? And not only that, cables. Did you read that news that Microsoft, Facebook, Google, they're all busy laying more transoceanic cables across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, across the Indian Ocean, because they expect an increase in telecommunications and data data usage okay so are they handling it by satellites absolutely not it is all being handled terrestrially my friends that is how it is being done and as we wind down this video this gal at the end says it's the age of satellites oh no 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 this is anything but the age of satellites but before White Alice was even complete, a new technology arrived to replace it. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite. 
U.S. development of satellite communications ramped up, and by 1967, just eight years after the network's completion, the government began to divest from the very system it built. Interestingly, White Alice remained in use until the late 70s as a civilian phone network. And today, the military still uses tropo scattering networks here and there because they're still really secure. But this remains the era of satellites. So this gal on this video alleges that uh, this White Alice communication system and similar tropospheric scatter systems were replaced by satellites. And she says that this remains the age of satellites. So that is a, a question that we should ask ourselves. Is that really true? That were any of these actually replaced by satellites? And is this truly the age of satellites? For 21 years, they were the portal to the outside world as well as a crucial visual reference for snow machiners and pilots headed home from across the tundra. However, by the 1970s, satellite communication was becoming more feasible and proved to be a cheaper option than maintaining far-flung stations across Alaska. Some White Alice sites were sold off to private buyers, and some simply went offline. The Bethel site was officially decommissioned in 1979. Over the ensuing decades, the Air Force and Bethel locals stripped the site. Five of the six towers were torn down sometime between 1983 and 1999, yet one solitary tower continued to dominate the Bethel horizon. Yeah, I would say that it is rather ironic that these commentators, you know, they cannot look at their own videos and see for themselves what is right in front of their eyes. As he is talking about these towers being torn down and being replaced by satellites, what do we see in the picture, we see not just one tower, which is much taller and much higher than the one that was torn down, but we see two with multiple dishes on them, okay? So to say that, you know, it was satellites that replaced them, then what was the need for these much higher towers to be built? You see, these higher towers, the purpose that they serve is they provide a higher line of sight, okay? So that if you have one high, very high tower, another high tower in a very far distance, these towers can communicate with each other in a direct line of sight. If it was coming from satellites, you know, you don't need to build your towers so high. The signal from the sky can be, you know, can be caught by a little dish sitting on the side of a building. Why would you need all these such high and higher towers than ever before? unless it is an upgrade of the very same system, that those very unsightly and huge antennas have now been replaced by much powerful but smaller antennas, and they are placed on a higher tower so that the range can be extended even further than it was before, but the technology is essentially still the same. <clears throat> The men change from a wheel to a track vehicle, a snowcat, during the last leg of the trip to the summit of a local mountain, where the signal core tropospheric site is located. The site provides an important radio link for worldwide Army communications. The link is unique in many respects. The miniature Eiffel Tower on the mountaintop is 160 feet tall and has four 30-foot parabolic antennas. Supplies often must be brought in by helicopter because of the severe local weather conditions during most of the year. Within the remote communication control center buried in the snow is found the elaborate electronic equipment providing the important radio systems which connect with other global army facilities. The Feldborg Schwarzwald site has drawn the interest of radio communicators the world over because of the inherent difficulties involved in establishing a 60 voice channel tropospheric scatter system with the Swiss Alps and weather variations to obstruct the signals. Yet, Army personnel working under these difficult operating conditions fulfill their assigned missions, keeping the channels open and the messages moving as their share in the preparedness of the United States Army in Europe. So this video is from 1967 and it showed you that even back then 
they had the technology was advanced enough that sitting up on the Swiss Alps, they had communication the world over with all American bases, which in America by that time had bases, you know, throughout Asia, through in Africa, in Europe, and in South America, basically all South and Central America, all over the world, and down in Australia. So these sites, like the one in the Swiss Alps, in California, all around the U.S. and the world, they were all connected by this system. And the man talked about the difficulty because of the weather conditions and, uh, you know, the location up in the mountains, etc. But they said that they kept them working. Now, the point is again here that if the weather conditions, which are so close to our atmosphere, they affect communications. How about like the space weather, which we are told is out there with the solar radiation, with the, with the, with the Van Allen radiation belts, with the, you know, highly ionized uh, layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere. So these signals from satellites, to, they can be just easily beamed up there and beamed back down without any degradation, without any loss, without any problems. I don't think so, okay? I really don't think so. Now, if you also notice in this video, what do you see? You see the tower design. It's a high tower with antenna, the transmitting antennas and receiving dishes. Very much so, you can go out in your town and especially, you know, just on the outskirts or you will see like these very high towers and with these numerous dishes on the sides. Same design except bigger and the dishes are smaller, uh, yet the technology is still the same. So satellites did not replace this technology. This technology of the towers transmitting and receiving terrestrially has actually grown by leaps and <clears throat> bounds since the 1960s and 70s. And if any of these older systems, like the White Alice, they were replaced, they were not replaced with satellites, they were replaced with just more efficient and more advanced and more miniaturized uh, dishes and transmitters as has happened in basically all technologies like computers have become smaller and faster, phone systems have become smaller and faster, so have these receiving and transmitting stations. Now for the rest of this uh, program, the rest of this video, I'm just going to use clips to show you the prevalence of towers, to show you how cell phones and television transmissions work, and to show you that this is a network across the earth which is far, far bigger than anything that existed in the 1960s. And the cabling, data cables being laid today are far greater than they had anything in the 20th century. So that means that communications, they are occurring across the surface of the earth, whether it's the land mass or the waters, it is not going up into space and then coming down from some kind of imaginary geostationary satellites. And if this, you know, bouncing out the atmosphere idea is valid, then what is happening is that it is being bounced off the firmament, as I showed you. It's just hitting into the clouds and expecting it to come back down in a specific point. It is not scientific and it is an impossibility.
Hi, my name is Bill Barney. I'm with Community Dish in Pahrump, Nevada. I'm an SBCA licensed installer, that's Satellite Broadcast Communications Association, and I'd like to help you with your satellite installation. In its simplest form, the satellite does nothing more than redirect signal. It picks it up from a uh, earthbound location in space, then rebroadcasts it and refocuses it to another earthbound location back down to the earth. In its simplest form, that's exactly what a satellite does. Dish Network and DirecTV and other type of video type satellites are geosynchronous in their location. That is key. What that means is that the satellite movement is, is exactly at the same movement of the earth. That keeps the orbit in the same spot in the sky. This is what makes the smaller dishes, in part, operable to work. Without geosynchronous orbit, the dish would have to move in order to track the satellite in the sky. The other thing that makes these small dishes work, as opposed to the larger, older dishes, is the power at which they transmit from. With the new technology and the new ability to uh, take sun power and convert it into usable electrical power, 22,400 miles up in space, that gives us the ability to have a smaller reflector plate and that makes for a lot smaller satellite dish and a lot less expensive equipment at the property and the location of the home. So as you watch these next few clips, just keep in mind what this man was just saying, that uh, he said nothing about how these signals are transmitted from Earth to the satellite, because that is a distance of some 23,000 miles, you know, some 40,000 kilometers up in the sky. But he said that the satellites up there, because they have solar power, they are able to transmit it back down because they are very powerful transmitters. And therefore you need only very small dishes to capture those signals. So as you watch these next few clips with these giant towers, you know, then you ask yourself that question, you know, why is it that these towers need to be so very, very high? And the answer to that, of course, is that they need a direct line of sight. These towers can only communicate with each other through direct line of sight, which is why they keep getting taller and taller and taller. And that kind of brings into question for me whether this whole tropospheric scattering technology actually has anything at all to do with signals being beamed up into the atmosphere and being beamed down, or that these towers that were constructed, even back in the 60s, they all had a line of sight, you know, technology that they worked upon. Anyways, be that as it may, these towers, as they get taller, the only explanation is that the signals that they are capturing, they are not coming up from the sky, but from the ground itself. That's why they need to be so very high that they can be in the line of sight. Now understand that cell towers and TV towers work a little bit differently, but we will also take a look at TV signals in the next couple of clips.
Look at the beautiful plane of the flat earth in this video. But again, the height of these towers, whereas those ones in Alice, White Alice, were 60 feet high. And average of some of these towers, this one is like 1,500 feet high. So again, the question remains, if it was satellites that replaced this technology, why would you need such high towers? You know, the satellite signal it should be receivable, like that man said, that you know you only need a small dish, so you should be able to capture it anywhere. You don't need to build these giant structures. But again, they are built like that because they are necessary for the way communications, telecommunications work on our earth. They work through these antennas that are mounted on these very high towers so they can reach a greater distance across the flat plane to the next tower, so that these towers can be spread out and more communications can be handled by each one of them. That is the reason why they keep getting taller and taller and taller. Now let's take a look at some TV towers and see if that man's you know, saying that these signals are sent out into space to 24,000 miles high, and then they're broadcast back down, if that makes any sense whatsoever. This video is that of a TV radio broadcasting, uh, you know, a station around uh, Philadelphia. You can see the city of Philly down there, and uh, these are the towers. Now, ask yourself this question, folks. Does it make sense that this TV station that has a broadcasting tower there, that it is going to broadcast its signal 24,000 miles up into space, and then it'll be beaming down 24,000 miles back to reach the town, which is right next to the tower. Is it not much simpler and much more inexpensive rather than having this expensive satellites that cost millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, and then they have, you know, uh, launching costs and uh, maintenance costs and all that? Is it not much easier than if somebody had a dish down below that the signal is uh, sent out directly to that dish from this tower or that town rather than into space. That's how your satellite dishes work. You have these broadcast towers, they beam their signals and your dish catches it. It is not coming from space, all right? So yes, what they call satellite TV is actually nothing more than a receiver dish 
that captures the signals that are coming from these towers. The whole idea of satellite communications is an asinine one. And as I pointed out, with all the interference that is possible and should happen, and first of all, the challenge of getting the signal up there to begin with and then to bring it down and make it pass through the Van Allen radiation belts to come through the different layers of the so-called atmosphere that they tell us exist, to the solar, high solar radiation areas, to the highly ionized ionosphere, and then of course when they have electrical disturbances, and to be sure that you know it is going to be always uninterrupted service, I don't think so. Even like a little electric storm can cause a disruption in your satellite service, you know why? It is not because the signal is coming from space, it is coming from these towers, and uh, these electrical disturbances get between you and the dish. If they had to come from space, the signal would never make it to you. The link to this video on GPS is in the description, and uh, uh, some of it is uh, it's about five minutes long, and some of it is uh, written information, which you need to read on the screen, and it's very good, because GPS basically is nothing new. It's, uh, it's just an updated technology from technologies that were developed way back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, especially very well refined by the Second World War, such as Lorraine, which is long-range navigation, okay? And they were all land-based, and even today, if you read these documents, you will find out that uh, sky-based navigation systems are not very reliable, again, because of that problem with interference from electrical disturbances, the ionized particles, etc., which, uh, which do not make them as reliable as something that is based on the ground. All right, so please read these carefully and uh, understand that GPS is not new and it is not based upon satellites floating around somewhere way up there. Let's open the Maps application and see what we get. Today we're filming in New York City and let's go to the location where we are right now, which is the biggest addition to the new version of Google Maps. It uses cell tower triangulation and not GPS to determine the location of this particular device. It uses cell tower triangulation and not GPS to determine the location of this particular device. Cell tower triangulation and not GPS.
One thing to keep in mind is that we're actually shooting this inside. The cell tower signals do permeate buildings well enough that we're able to triangulate this position. This would not work as well with GPS. GPS really does need you to be outside to work at its best. It is kind of funny how people react when the new iPhone comes out. Some people actually get mad. Why would they make another product? I desperately want to buy those bastards. It's almost as if the new iPhone somehow ruins the old iPhone, but it doesn't. It's, it's all in your head. In fact, we set a camera out on the street today, and we told people outside to check out the new iPhone 5, which is unavailable so far. So in reality, they were, what they were looking at is the current iPhone 4S that everyone has. <laughs> And, well, here's how that experiment played out. The new iPhone 5 just came out today. We want to know if you'll take a look at it. Tell us how it compares to the last iPhone. I'd love to. Oh, it's way better. Yeah, it's nice. That's definitely noticeably better. It's a little, a little thinner. Looks like the screen's a little bigger. Seems a little bit faster. The Retro Brick is a wireless Bluetooth handset for your cell phone that is faithfully recreated in the style of a 1980s Brick cellular phone. Hello? Okay, in conclusion, folks, most of our techn communication technologies, whether it's like telecommunications, radio, TV, they worked through land-based systems, okay? There is a network of transmitters and receivers. These have gotten more sophisticated over time, but the technology is old. Just like I said, computer technologies have evolved, so have telecommunication and radio technology, transmission technologies. Uh, this idea that, you know, a signal has to be beamed up into space 24,000 miles up and then beam back down. It is a ridiculous idea. It would not work. Even this tropospheric scattering technologies or ionos ionosphere scattering technologies where the signal is aimed up at the sky, basically at clouds and expected to beam back down into a specified location, it makes absolutely no sense. Unless if this technology exists, it is a confirmation of the firmament that at least those two points in this, the uh, the midpoint and the receiving point, they have to be fixed. Even if the transmission point was movable, you know, they, the, the, the point that which it's aimed at from which it will be reflected back down, it has to be fixed. It can't be movable. Otherwise, you would never know where the signal was going to end up. You would basically be like, uh, you know, chasing a dog, chasing his tail, trying to figure out, you know, Granny's calling. So let me go and run and see, like, you know, where the signal is going to uh, materialize. Okay. So triangulation only works if at least two of those objects are fixed. And in this case, wherever the signal is being aimed at, it has to be fixed. So that would indicate that there is a firmament above from which these signals are being beamed back down. Or the other alternative is that it's all land-based, that all these uh, microwave transmission towers, they are in line of sight, uh, and that's the way they work, okay? Or the transmission is done through data cables. Satellites, nah, just fiction, like Arthur C. Clarke said. You know, the fiction sci-fi writer invented it, and it is still science fiction. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandu.
Make them all here so 